All right. Let's see. Let's uh, make sure that everybody can hear okay. Got lots of good folks. I also want to point out today that we are going to be doing some giveaways. I have five brand new T drives. Some are in the brown colorway. Others are in the gold colorway. I'll be giving away five of these throughout the stream today. And these will be shipped directly to you. And this is available whether you are in the United States, whether you're in Europe, whether you're in Asia, any continent. We do not discriminate. Whatever that is, this is where we will send these pedals. So again, I have five of these I'm going to be giving away today. And the way that the giveaway component works is essentially what you need to do is you're going to answer a question. We're going to kind of have like a, a vertex pop quiz. I'm going to be asking you questions about things that we ordinarily talk about during our streams. So these could be things about buffers, these could be things about power supplies, these could be things all over the map that we talk about regularly as best practices for DIYers. And if you answer those questions correctly, the first person to do so will be a person that gets a free pedal. So we're going to be talking about that. It's going to be pretty cool. You're going to get to see all this and we're going to do it a little bit differently today. Today, how we're going to do it is you're actually going to email us when I ask you the question because one of the difficulties that we've had is we've had to track down the winners. Some people just don't like free stuff for whatever reason. So we had some people win and we were celebrating with them in the comments and then when it came time to get them their stuff, they disappeared and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't contact them. So I think this way what we'll do is we'll have you email us your answers. So we'll get a bunch of emails presumably, uh, which is okay. But uh, the first one that comes in, it'll be easier for us just to see whose email comes in first. There is some delay on YouTube, I noticed. So some people will answer the question first. They'll see it on their screen as though they answered first. But in the master feed that we have on our end, it maybe shows up three or four comments in. And so there were some discrepancies where people are like, oh, I, I, I thought I won. And then they show me their screenshot. And we took screenshots last time as well where comments will come in in different orders, different than maybe what you see on your screen. So this will just eliminate it altogether. You'll just email us your answer and uh, we can check that immediately. And Mejia uh, can go back and, and, and do it from there. So that'll be easier. I also have uh, mint water here today. It's pretty warm, so I have the door open back there. So our lighting is a little bit blown out, but I think we'll make do. So uh, just wanted to thank Justice, by the way, for the uh, super chat. We're going to have some good sleepers here for you. And I'm actually anxious to hear about your sleepers as well. And if you've never heard this term, sleeper pedal, uh, I'd be surprised if you haven't. But if you haven't, basically it's a pedal that, that maybe is a little bit under the radar. Maybe people haven't heard of it or not aware of it. And uh, some, most of these pedals are below $200. Some of them you can get way below $200 if you're kind of timing the market right. You're looking to see when stuff's coming out. Uh, and some of them are, uh, some of these are even below like $75. So these are some good sleepers that I've used over the years and that I still use now. And, uh, and I think that they really have withstood the test of time. And so I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to hear what you guys think. I'm going to be demonstrating some of them. I'm just so you kind of know my signal path today. I'm going to be using a uh, kind of like my shredder, my 80s shredder, shredder strat. It's made to resemble the 1965 Dan Huff Stratocaster uh, that was modified <laughs> to have a Floyd Rose. Um, so that's what I'm going to be using today. This is made by LSL and uh, it's a really great replica. LSL makes fantastic guitars and. Uh, this one is excellent. So I'm going to be using this, and the reason why is that it's got a humbucker. Some of these kind of gainier pedals, I think, sound a little bit better with a, a humbucking pickup. And the, I have a, um, the humbucking pickup in there is a Tyler Secret pickup, which I think is made by Seymour Duncan, actually, but I don't know. I, this is what I've heard. And then the, uh, the neck and middle are DiMarzio Virtual Vintage. Those are going into a clean Fender Concert, uh, which is a 60-watt head. And then that is going to a Fryette power load. So I'm not using any speakers today. I'm using a reactive load with speaker emulation uh, that is all analog. And then that is going to be feeding into my Pro Tools, into my Apollo, and then that's feeding this. So that's what you're going to be hearing today when you hear me 
playing the guitar. I will keep it minimal just so you can, you know, kind of get get the vibe. But uh, th that's kind of the uh, the basics that we're going to be doing. So I'm going to pull up some of these slides here today so you can kind of see good representations of exactly what it is I'm talking about. Now, if you're on Instagram or you're on Facebook, this is going to sound really, really bizarre to you because you're not going to see any of these photos. Everything photo-wise that's happening, everything sound-wise that's happening is all going to be on YouTube. So when you hear me playing the guitar, it's just going to sound like somebody playing an acoustic electric guitar. Uh, in other words, not like an acoustic electric, like a Takami that has a piezo pickup. It's going to sound like somebody strumming on an unplugged electric guitar. So you want to make sure if you are interested in really hearing it, uh, you definitely want to uh, make sure that you tune in to us on the YouTube side, which is linked in our bio, which is linked in the very first comment that I made on Facebook. So let's uh, pull these up. I got some slides here. Let's just see what our very first one is that uh, Mejia put in the batch here. And then we'll get into questions after we go through these. Or maybe we'll go periodically because I think last time there were so many questions it was, uh, it was hard to keep up. So maybe we'll go intermittently between the two. All right, here we go. Rig Doctor Slides. So this is the first one actually. This one is a, is a super cool uh, one. This is the, the Jocks. Meister Singer Chorus. Uh, a lot of people know about this, maybe, but uh, a lot of people don't. So I wanted to talk to you about the Me Meister Singer Chorus. I mean, if the name does not enroll you alone, then what are we even doing here, really? Um, so I have it plugged in here, and uh, it's mono. So some people who are seeking a stereo course, uh, they couldn't use it like this, but you could always buy two, and you could have stereo then. So this thing sounds pretty great. I think it sounds like the 80s thing. It's pretty unreal. Now this is the part where everybody who's on Instagram and, and Facebook are not going to be able to hear anything. So I'm going to put on my headphones here so I can actually hear what's going on. And let's, uh, so here's the drive. And that's just a little reverbs coming from the, uh, from the amplifier. I'm just going to put everything at noon here on the Meister Singer. Kind of has a little bit of like a dimension D thing. Kind of more like the Holdsworth. I think it sounds really cool, and that's just with the everything at noon. But let me kind of jack up the depth and the effect and see if we can get kind of more of the. Uh, LA chord. It's kind of the keyboard sounding. I think it sounds really, really pretty. fantastic sounding chorus it's all analog uh, bucket brigade and uh, I think it's one of the one of the coolest ones out there now again this is the Jacques Meister singer chorus this is a really good one there's a couple guys I think that are kind of are, are on the they kind of in the know that maybe know about this thing but for most people they don't and this one is sort of their newest looking one but they had other ones that kind of looked more like boss pedals and they had a similar sort of actuator as a boss pedal it's the exact same thing and I see these routinely between like a hundred and a hundred and ten dollars or so so it's actually a really great deal like you can I've even seen some for like eighty nine dollars so if you want like a really nice legit analog bucket brigade chorus that like really does kind of like the faux tri stereo or the kind of the dimensional sounds, I mean it really kind of gets that keyboardy kind of takes the bass out, but that's part of that sound. I mean put some delay and compression on that, and you're 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 in the LA studio tone. Great 
sounding unit. So I highly recommend this one. Again, if you are on Facebook or you're on Instagram and this just sounds like somebody playing an acoustic uh, guitar, it's because everything is being routed through uh, my Apollo, through our Pro Tools, and going into YouTube. I can't simultaneously cast on all of these platforms. So I just wanted to know, wanted you to know that. I did give that announcement earlier on. I'm just trying to get a little bit better angle here for our folks who are on, uh, who are on uh, Facebook here. Let's see if I can maneuver this a little differently. How about that? That's better. Now I'll fix the YouTube for the, the Instagram one. There we go. Cool. So that's why you can't hear it. If you're on Instagram, you're on Facebook, you can't hear anything, it's because you need to be on YouTube. I can't stream the guitar audio through here so that you can hear it. All right. So that is this very first one, the Jacques Meistersinger. It's a very German kind of name, um, but Jacques, I don't know, is that French? Maybe. So that's the very first one. Um, Let's see. Let's uh, let's break for a second and let's talk. Uh, let's talk about uh, our giveaway contest that we're going to be doing today, and uh, we'll maybe give away one pedal here to start things off. So if you weren't privy to what we were talking about in in the earlier part of it, we're going to be giving away a T drive. Five of them, in fact, five of them throughout the stream. So this is going to be the very first T drive. Some of it will resemble this pedal exactly. I also have a couple of the limited edition ones that were Shoreline Gold. It's a pretty cool color, classic Fender color. Great device. It's got a distortion pedal, kind of resembles the train wreck, which is kind of a cross between like an AC30 and a Marshall, I think is the easiest way I could put it. So this is a great pedal. You'll get this for free, and it's available for everybody, whether you're in U.S., whether you're international. doesn't matter. If you win, you're going to get it free of charge, and even if you're out of state, I will mark it as a gift, and hopefully that will uh, prevent you from incurring any unnecessary customs fees, because I know how that can really be problematic for some of you uh, people internationally. So the first question that I want to know, and some of these questions we've talked about lots and lots of times, I want to know, and this is again, when you answer this question, you're not going to answer it in the, in the box below. We talked about it a little bit earlier, if you missed that, you're actually going to email me. Okay, so I'm even going to put it in the, uh, in the description right now in the comments, and I'm going to write the email address that you're going to send it to. You're going to send it to Mejia, and you're just going to flood his email box, his inbox. It's Mejia at VertexEffects.com. I'm putting it right now in the chat, Mejia at VertexEffects.com. Just overload him with the answers to this. The first one that comes in is going to be the person that wins. Okay, the first one that comes in with the correct answer is going to be the one that wins. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit before in our last stream, but I want to know because this is very important. I want you to tell me two distinguishing features differences between a linear power supply and a switching power supply. I want you to name me two key characteristics about linear power supplies versus switching power supply. So give me some differences here. Give me some key features. Two of those things will do. You're going to email it to Mejia at vertexeffects.com. If you're on Facebook or you're on Instagram, you're going to need to come and join us over on YouTube in order to have the full beginnings, ends, everything that gets given away is going to happen right over here. So you want to make sure that you do that, you answer it correctly. Now, if you heard me dictate that email, obviously you could, you could go and, and do it yourself. But uh, stay ready with your email open because we're going to continue this. So we're going to be continuing on. I'm going to take a few questions and we're going to go to our next sleeper pedal. Um, well, Andrew Day, you probably know by now we're giving away some tea drives today. It'd be pretty cool. Uh, a win today would be great. We want to keep it great. Joey Owen from the UK. What's up, buddy? Uh, good morning from Down Under, from Australia. My guitar journey. Nice to see you. Uh, what time is it here? Well, it's uh, 4.15 or 4.16. Um, let's see, we got some folks from Israel. Shout out to Israel. My friends, hey, New York, 1 a.m. in Norway. You're a trooper, man. You're hanging in there. 8.30 a.m. in Australia. Like we get a good smattering of people. Um, let's, uh, 
Let's get into a few of these questions. Uh, Bent Tom Mason, how can I mod my old Plexitone to add a 9-volt power adapter in place of the wall cord? Well, one of the pedals that we are going to be talking about today, maybe we'll talk about this next since uh, we got our buddy Bent Tom, uh, is the Plexitone. I actually don't see it in my slides list, do I? Let's see, do I see it in the slides? No, I don't have it in my slides. Well, I have the single channel version of the Plexitone here. But this one is is essentially exactly the same as the one that you were talking about, uh, Bent Tom. Uh, it is exactly the same as this, except it's two channels. So there's this one plus another one, and then it also has a boost in it as well. So if people aren't familiar with that, it's basically the same exact pedal as this version of the Plexitone, which is a single channel one. The original one, however, had two different channels, same exact voicing and everything about the circuit was the same on both channels. You could just adjust them differently. And then there was a boost. I think the boost came after the, the two different channels that you hit A, B between, and the boost was independent. So it would be difficult to do on your own because I think the supply is plus or minus 15, if I recall. And then I was using a DC-DC converter uh, so that you could have nine volts on the input and then it would go up to plus or minus 15 Maybe it was plus or minus 12. I don't remember what it was It was something like it was either plus or minus 12 or plus or minus 15 So you would need to have a DC DC converter. It's not a simple mod It actually was pretty involved and then I added a mid-range control in the ones that we used to mod You can find them on reverb every once in a while, but those are not so sleepery anymore. They're they're expensive. I think when we were modifying them, I think we were charging like 350 or something like that because it was like we had to put a whole another tone stack on both channels uh, in order to do it, and we convert it to true bypass. Um, and uh, we did something to the boost. I don't even remember. I haven't done one of these in probably five, at least five years, probably more than that. Um, but it was a cool pedal. And speaking of cool pedals, we're gonna check out. Whoop, sorry. <laughs> We're going to check out the single channel version, which is this guy right here. So this is basically exactly the same as what you would get if you had gotten the uh, the larger one, except you'd get two different voicings of these. Now, I think it's actually a pretty good... It sounds great with a, with a Strat, like in the neck pickup, for kind of that glassier Strat tone. Let me just kind of dial that in. Ooh, that's really loud. Hopefully I didn't uh, damage anybody's gain over there. Still kind of gaining. So in the neck in the neck pickup on a strat, and this is kind of dialed, this is kind of how I have it dialed. Let's see if I can get up there. My dog's talking to us too. Let's see what is this caught on. And again, if you're on YouTube. Or you're on Facebook and you can't hear anything it's because you're not joining us for the most interactive experience all right here we go plexi tone there it is there's sort of in focus so that's kind of how I have it set now this is kind of like a good you know Hendrixy kind of glassy <laughs> has a nice glassiness to it and it cleans up pretty well so like this is like if you were going to go uh, it's got a nice glassiness and if you go to your humbucking bridge it, it's <laughs> got a nice kind of growl to it and then if you want to go higher gain it's kind of like a higher gain setting let's I don't want to make it too loud because I don't want to hurt definitely can get kind of like not metally but shreddy in it definitely get more of those shreddy tones but this is based actually on another one that we're going to talk about in a little bit which is called the Marshall governor and basically the plexi tone is very similar to this circuit a lot of guys who are doing high gain stuff base their kind of Marshall-y style higher gain devices off of this particular pedal which was the governor let me uh, get bent Tom's 
comment closed out. Sorry, Ben, Tom, I didn't mean to uh, leave you up there forever. But uh, we're going to go through this one later. I actually think this one's even better because you have extra controls for mid-range and bass and treble, whereas on the Plexi Tone, even the original one, you just had a, a tone control and that was it. And these things are killer, like really great. Like Gary Moore used to use these guys, and they sound really great even through clean amps. So we'll kind of hear, like, this guy is, is pretty aggressive sounding, the, the, the Plexi Tone. It's certainly, certainly capable of, of uh, pretty aggressive sounds. But this guy, like you can mellow it out, you can make it even gainier than this guy. So I think you should definitely check out the Marshall one as well. But we'll go through that in a little bit later. And I'm sorry I'm not uh, an expert high gain, sort of Marshall-y gain style player. But uh, hopefully you can kind of have a representative sample of, of one of those pedals. But man, like these Plexi Tones, I just got this one on Reverb. I think it was like $97. And that wasn't even the cheapest one on there. So these are definitely inexpensive. They make a newer version of it now. I don't know what, how that compares. I haven't tried it. And it's called like the low gain or something like that. But this one sounds really good and it cleans up great. And uh, really, really good sounding pedal. Very amp-like even through a totally bone clean Fender concert here. Um, let's go and take a few more questions and then uh, we'll go back to some sleepers. All right, so, okay, audio is good. David. So you're basically helping all of us with DIY tips, then you're rewarding us for listening. <laughs> all right, well, I'm glad you see it that way. God Emperor, the best sleeper pedal is the Vertex Axis Wall. No, wait. So it looks like God Emperor there was, I don't know, maybe either trying to josh me or was trying to take a shot at me, but I've been pretty candid about uh, everything that has gone on with that. And if you own this pedal and, and uh, you weren't aware of your options, every person that ever owned that product received a full refund or whatever restitution they wanted if that wasn't something that they wanted. So uh, I hope that that's a, uh, a, a fair uh, response to God Emperor. Maybe that was just done as a, as a joke, or maybe it was, I don't know, another intent. I'll, I'll assume positive intent on that. Uh, can you discuss the buffer patch bay you will be releasing? Maybe the dimensions, at least. Uh, not sure what size board I will need, and this will help plan. Well. You need to, you'll need it to be at least the size of the jacks. So I would I would sort of presume sort of the normal size pedals, you know, kind of this size pedal. And it depends on what you need. You can only really fit four jacks across this. So if it's this size, you're only really going to be able to, to do either a mono system with an effects loop. You could do a stereo system. Um, but uh, but you wouldn't be able to have any extra loops. Our intent is to release a couple. So you'd have one that would be for mono and effects loop, or you could use the effects loop as an audition loop. It could go either way uh, if you didn't have an amp with an effects loop. And then there'll be a stereo version, so that'll be three buffers, input, and then two output buffers. Uh, and those will be transformer isolated. And I would say that those are going to be a little bit bigger. It'll probably either be in a box that's more like this size because you're going to need the height to stagger the jacks, or it could even be in a larger box, more like see if I have one on the shelf, more like a, a MXR flanger size because we're going to need the extra space for for those jacks. So I would say presume those sizes, but we're not going to use these style boxes. Just like with our vertex boxes, we will fabricate our own metal. You know, so it'll be a folded style like this, and it'll be as small as it can be. And the jacks are usually the limitation on that. The circuit board itself is very small. So it's really how many jacks can fit next to each other, and then there's going to be a threshold that's determined by that. Um, so that hopefully that helps give you an idea. As we said, Justice, the email will be mejia at vertexeffects.com. I did post that in the comments. Uh, buffer, I'm hoping by the uh, end of the summer. Uh, that was me, lost the EVH rig because I don't <laughs> Instagram much. I'm sorry about that, my friend. Uh, yeah, this happened. I think people are talking about what happens when they answer their, 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 uh, send in their emails. Uh, Dustin, where can we buy the individual pedal risers for the mayor, from the mayor board build? Oh, those you can get on a fixpedalboard.com website. You can get them right there. They are there now. Uh, when will the buffer come out? Yeah, it'll come out, I hope, this summer. Um, let's see. Most pedals from Exotic are sleepers? I don't know. I wouldn't agree with that, typically, um, because they're they're very widely sold. Exotic is one of the best-selling boutique companies in, in the world, I would say. Most of their pedals are selling tens of thousands. Um, these are pedals that, 
you know, if they sold tens of thousands, it was at a time when most of the consumers that are buying stuff now were not aware of these brands or weren't alive to experience these brands. Um, let's see. Sean Pierce Johnson. Hey, bud. So many sleeper pedals. Um, not to come by them when you're <laughs> making your living around them. Yeah. Lots of lots of ones there. Big fan of the yellow cake for a burrito. Don't know that one. D o d looking glass. Yeah, that is a good one. I actually don't have one, but that is a very good one. Um, when are we expecting the pedal boards? I'm trying to get them. I have them all photoed. We're trying to get to them by the end of the week. Um, so that is the the hope is that we will get them up on the website and then give a a firm date on that. Uh, no updates yet on the buffer, as said before. Hello there. Uh, question from Instagram. Top sleeper pedals are Super Tremolo, Brown Protein, Cali 76 Stacked. I don't know if I'd agree with the Cali 76 stack. Cali 76 is pretty widely used and and known that it's a great pedal. Um, but I think Super Tremolo and Brown Protein are, 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 are fair. Um, maybe not a sleeper, but too many people, not too many people know about the Dumb Kudo by Mr. Tanabe. I love mine. Yeah, that's a cool kind of dumbbell sounding uh device and it has kind of like a nice uh kind of abalone top on it which is pretty cool um rothwell pedals are great yeah those were huge for a minute i remember uh andy from uh pro guitar shop did some demos of some of these and they were really good i don't know what happened to them though they it seemed like it was short-lived i wonder if you can still get them um let's see Little laggy on YouTube. Okay, well, it looks like it's back on track now. Um, this is another one from Instagram. T-Rex replica box delay is hugely underrated or highly underrated. Yeah, that is. Uh, I don't have one now. I actually gave mine to Gabriel Bergman for uh, the John Mayer rig that we've built. Um, and, uh, and so I gave mine away to him. But those are fantastic delays and still was one of the first delays that really worked well in an effects loop. So I remember that a lot of people were going for it for that reason. This was before the time factor and stuff like that. Um, let's see, another one. Sleeper pedals are Cusack, Resound, Swindler Red, Mountain V2, CK Audio, C Clone. I haven't heard of a lot of those. I've heard of the Cusack stuff. Uh, low End Gold. Hey, Miss. Hey, George. Again, if you folks are on uh, Instagram or you're on uh, Facebook, come join us over on YouTube. That's where the more ex the better experience is. Um, let's see. Not sure if it's a sleeper, but underrated. The RV5 is so good. Yeah, that's the boss one. Well, let's, uh, let's get into another giveaway question. Remember, I have five of these T-Drives, and we're giving these away all over the world. doesn't matter where you're from. And again, I'm going to put in the comments box below on YouTube. You want to email your answer to Mejia at VertexEffects.com. Just flood and overload his email <laughs> with the answers to this question. Okay, so I'm going to talk about another thing because we, we talked about when our buffers are coming out. So I want to know. These are going to be... These are going to be uh, something that you're going to answer through email to Mejia. So you're going to get your email ready. So just get it ready in front of you. Get ready to type in whatever your answers are. Have Mejia at vertexeffects.com as the sending to. You want to have everything ready to go. The question is, I want to know these three specs. When you're deciding on the impedances of your input and output buffer, I want to know what should the input impedance be and what should the output impedance be? And this is the third part of it that's going to be tricky. Is let's say that the input or output impedance doesn't quite match the standard. I want you to tell me what the range, acceptable range is for input and output impedances that are acceptable. So I want you to tell me what the ideal input, ideal output impedance is, and then what the range of acceptable input and output impedances are for a buffer. Go ahead and write that to Mason Mejia. First person answered it correctly will win a free T drive. All right. Let's, uh, while that's happening, let's go into uh, 
another one that I dig. See, we talked about, uh, we did the plexi tone, we moved the ones we were done aside. Done that. Let's go to, um, I don't know if this one has a battery in it or not. This is one of the, this is a great one for tremolo. Actually, yeah, there's two great ones I have here for tremolo. I have the BFD, which is the ba Blackface Deluxe tremolo. Excellent tremolo. It's actually made by Bad Cat. Uh, as the as the manufacturer, although they weren't the one that that designed it, it was a company called Vintage Technologies, and then the Keeley modded TR2. But even the stock TR2 is pretty dang good. So I want you to hear these. I want to see if this one doesn't have a a, a nine volt on it. So I don't I forget whether I put a battery in. If I if I didn't, then I apologize, and uh, we'll have to check it out another time. But my fingers are crossed right now that there's some sort of power in this thing. Let's hear what this Blackface Deluxe BFD sounds like. Ah, uh, yeah, it's there. This is such a good natural analog tremolo. Very natural. Let's go like a single kind of. It's got a really cool pulse to it. Very Fender like if you're into the classic sort of Fender style uh, tremolo sounds. This is really excellent. Uh, I think it just works on a 9-volt battery inside. There isn't even a tap on this thing. Of course, you could modify that very easily. But, man, it's got – it's. it was uh, – I remember early on, like, when I was a teenager, these were these were kind of huge. Like, everybody was – everybody was into these. Sounds really great. Very natural. Let's compare that to the uh, – the Keeley one. I like the Keeley because uh, it's got the uh, the volume control, and sometimes when you have a lot of depth on it, you can lose a lot of output. So this kind of helps mitigate some of that issues. Let's use. You can hear already; it's louder. Too. These are both really inexpensive. I can get, uh, you can get a regular Boss TR2 for 50 bucks any day of the week on Craigslist or on Reverb. Getting the Keeley modded one I think just makes it a little quieter, gives you that volume control. I love, I have a couple of these, I adore these, but I also love this Blackface Deluxe. If you just need a really simple straight ahead Fender Tremolo, you can't go wrong with these. A lot of people don't even know what these are. I've, I, got, I think I got this one for $89 on Reverb. It was such a steal. They sound incredible. Both of these are fully analog. No digital perversions whatsoever. So, let's, uh, let's take a few more questions here. <clears throat> and let me uh, put this amp on standby so I don't get any of that through here. All right, and again, if you can't hear anything and you're on Facebook or you're on Instagram, it's because you need to join us over on YouTube in order to get the full experience. All right, Washburn Stereo, of course, is a pretty bomb two-tone vintage Japanese made, bought for 50 bones. Very cool. That's a good one. I didn't even know about that one. Sweet. Um, let's see. 
Is the Vertex Y available again? It is not. It hasn't been available since 2014. Uh, what is your number one guitar? My number one guitar is either the Rory Gallagher one over here. This guy, the Rory Gallagher Strat. It's probably the, the one. I have another one that uh, is a 50s style two-tone sunburst that you probably have seen in some of our videos. That's probably the other one. Um, but this one is the most versatile, the LSL one. It, it sounds really great. It's definitely kind of more of like a studio type thing. It's got the noiseless DiMarzio uh, virtual vintage pickups, and then it's got the Tyler pickup in the bridge and the Floyd. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty worthless with the, with the Floyd Rose. I mean, I just got it because I'm a fan of Dan Huff, and that's kind of how he had his uh, mid '60s guitar setup. I actually don't even, I don't even think I've changed, <laughs> I've changed the string on it. I've always just taken it uh, somewhere to have the string changed because I'm so uh, unaware of the technique of restringing a Floyd Rose. So maybe I'll actually have to go to YouTube to, to check that out because it is in, in a little bit of need of strings. Um, let's see. Hello from Ottawa, Chicago. <laughs> These questions are hard. Well, you know, from, for some people who've been watching these videos a lot, I'm hoping that they've learned from them, they've internalized some of this stuff, so they'll be able to uh, to to answer these questions. Is there a difference between dynamic distortion V1 and V2? Well, there's a look difference, but then there's also a internal difference, which is a little bit more range in the tone control. So overall gain is is about the same, uh, and volume same. The tone control is a little more versatile on V2 which you'll be able to distinguish that because it'll say thin and fat on the extreme ends of the tone control. Um, Sacramento, pro analog devices, am I allowed to answer question, uh, the supply question? <laughs> sure, why not, Scotty? Scotty is one of the original OG boutique pedal builders before any of us even knew anything about resistors, capacitors, or impedance. Um, Yeah, yeah, I don't have any plan to remake that, but I do have a cool wah here that we are going to talk about later. I'll give you a little sneak preview of that. This is called the Blubber Wah. This is made in Japan. This is made in the 70s, and they don't even actually refer to this as a wah. I don't know if you can see see this with the glare. Got a lot of glare. It's called a crying baby machine. So, I mean, just like, I just think it's a cool idea if you went into a shop and you're just like, yo, guys, you guys got any crying baby machines back there? Or what's up? Like, what a cool name. I think when, when things get back to, to normal here, I think we should stroll into a guitar center group of us and just ask them if they can show us their collection of crying baby machines instead of hoas. I think that that should be brought back. So we'll, we'll talk about that one. But one thing I love about this, first of all, the casting is super lightweight. It is really light. It's like half the weight of a normal wah, even though it's exactly the same shape. The other thing that's cool about it is it has that vintage throw that's really short, like a lot of the old boxes and the McCoys and the V846s. So it very much sounds and feels like uh, an old wah, box wah, an old crybaby wah, and it's, it's really pretty fantastic. And you can get those for like 99 bucks. Nobody knows what they are. Um, maybe after today, <laughs> they won't be 99 bucks anymore, but they are fantastic. Um, have you ever tried the Les Leas? Yeah, that's a cool pedal. I remember trying one. I think Josh Smith had showed it to me once. Hey, from Peru. Hey, from Sweden. Blues Driver Waza. I think versus OCD, too. They're totally different, man. I don't know if they're even comparable. I think that if you want a Marshall sound, the OCD is definitely better. Um, the Blues Driver is, is kind of... Uh, it always kind of, to me, when I play it, it always sounds like a buddy guy overdrive sound. It kind of has that really kind of crispy top. Um, it's a little nasal, but that's a cool sound depending on what you're going for. Hello from the Dominican Republic. What's happening all you pedal warriors from Uncle Scotty? What a bro. I'm getting four new fuzzes with my stimulus tomorrow. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, oh, plus or minus 12, we're talking back at the uh, Carl Martin. Okay, yeah, you're still going to need that DC to DC converter. Um... Let's see. 
My dog here, Zeke, and is looking for me. Yeah, Zeke's in the other room with my wife. She's on a, a Zoom call for her job. Um, so he likes hanging out with her when she's here. All right. Hey, Dre. Uh, question from Instagram. This is uh, Sleeper Pedals or Voodoo Lab Sparkle Drive. Very true. That's a great one. A great tube screamer. Um, Ivanez DL10 Delay. That is a good one. Uh, the Oco Coco Comp. I haven't heard of that one. Um, but I had an Oco Diablo once, uh, which is kind of like a Dumbly Overdrive. Frankie X, hey man, why not make your own line of tube amps? Yeah, tube amps, man, it's it's such a, that's a hard business to be in. It's the I think it's the hardest business in the industry to be in on the guitar side because people aren't buying 20 amps. You know, they're buying one or two amps. If you're doing pedals, you're getting, you know, 20 plus pedals a lot of times. Buying amps and being a good amp manufacturer is like, you know, being a refrigerator manufacturer. It's like if you make it well, nobody's going to need that amp again for 20 years. So it's like you're 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 selling a product where where people are just not buying a lot of those anymore. So a lot of amp manufacturers struggle to continue to sell volume of amps. And so I think the pedal industry is certainly where I, I plan to stay. I don't have any aspirations of, of building any amplifiers. And there's a lot of guys that build great Dumble amps. Uh, so you don't even need me to do that. You already have a bunch of great guys that can do that. Um, Tech 21 used to make some cool stuff. Yes, they did. They had a Vox uh, pedal that was incredible. I don't have one. Uh, but Henry Kaiser had hit me to it, and it's really, really cool. I love the Governor. I had the gold version. Governor's great. Um, <laughs> Scotty. Um, let's see. My favorite is the Vox V810 valve valve tone. It's true bypass. I don't know if I know this one. Is it the one that's like chrome? Uh, is if so, I might have heard of this one. Best tweed in a box. I had one here actually. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, I thought my favorite one was the one that Mad Professor made. I thought it was pretty pretty awesome. But maybe guys like Scotty have a good interpretation of that. Um, any tips for busting ground noise? Well, if you have a ground loop, an easy way would be to use uh, galvanic isolation, have an isolation transformer of some kind. A lot of people, I think, confuse what ground noise is, though. Because like sometimes just by having on your guitar volume on, and you take your hands off the instrument, you're going to have noise, whereas if you turn your guitar volume totally off, it's going to be silent. So a lot of times people are mistaking issues within the guitar that could be shielded for stuff that has to do with the ground noise. And they're really different things. And there's a difference between hum and there's a difference between buzz. So if you have galvanic isolation, most of the transformers that are used are output transformers. And they're going to be pretty good about getting rid of the ground hum. They're not going to be so good about getting rid of buzz. Um, and there's, you know, so there's different ways to, to attack this. So I, I guess the question for me is, is what exactly is the is the is the problem? Is it actually a ground loop? Because if it is, then that can typically be solved with again isolation transformers, depending on where you're getting it. Uh, it could just be that you don't have great quality cables. You have corroded connections. You have, um, you know, solderless cables. These are all things that could contribute to noise. Um, can you explain once again what a sleeper is? A sleeper is sort of like something that people have slept on or they haven't recognized as being a good sounding or a pedal that they're aware of. And so that, that's the definition that I'm using for this. Um, Uh, I don't know what this is in response to, but yeah, I, I was modding the, the devices before the smaller one came out. That That is true, but I don't know what the response is to. Have you all tried the Vox Delay Lab? I think, is that the Satriani thing? Um, I'm not sure. Question from IG. Top sleeper pedals, Cornerstone Antique. I haven't heard of that one. Boss C C E 2 I think people know about that one. Jesse Davey Blues Power. I think people know about Jesse Davey if they're in the if they're in the scene. I mean, they're I guess they're they're not a, like a boss pedal or anything like that. So I guess there there could be some truth to that. But uh, people who I mean, I certainly know about his pedals and know that they're great. 
Um, what is your favorite Klon style pedal? I think the best one is the Centura or the um, the Rocket, the J Rocket Archer ones. I think are the best. Um, let's uh, let's get into another pedal. We've talked about tremolos. We haven't talked about fuzzes yet. Right up Scotty's alley. Now I'll be curious to think what Uncle Scotty thinks of this one. But sleeper wise. The Carcosa is a pretty dang good fuzz. It sounds great, very dynamic. These are $99. I think new they're $99. I don't even know how much you can get them for now. And they take 9 volt, which is good. And they sound okay on 9 volt, which is unusual for a lot of fuzzes. And it can get even overdrivey if you want, if you don't want to kind of kick it into full fuzz gear. But man, this thing sounds good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug it in. Thank God for the uh, silent plug, so we don't have all this noise right now. All right, let's see what we got. All right. Looking at my... Sounds pretty, pretty well. pretty dynamic I don't even know I don't even look to see if it's germanium or if it's silicon but it's dynamic it sounds very good 99 bucks and uh, can definitely get you a lot of that kind of wooliness that that uh, classic fuzz tone and then it's got a couple of uh, cool little features with a high cut and you have a toggle to kind of give you a little bit more variety I think the Carcosa is definitely a winner for 99 bucks brand new I mean how can you go wrong with this this is a great Great fuzz, true bypass. The guys over at DOD made this before they stopped making pedals. So highly recommend you check out the uh, Carcosa. Excellent, excellent. Dig that one big time. Let's uh, let's give away another T drive. Remember, if you're new to this, you have, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You have, can't hear the guitar. The reason why is that we're broadcasting all this over on YouTube. So you want to join us on YouTube, there is a link in our bio, there's a link in this conversation. So if you want to get a T-Drive, you have to answer this question. Now this is going to be a multifaceted question, and you have to send it to Mejia's email. We're just going to flood him with email. It's Mejia at Vertex Effects. Dot com. I'm putting that in the chat box. You want to send this this answer to him so that he will know who the first person is to answer this correctly. What we're going to be talking to you about, what I want you to answer for me, this is something that we've been talking about a lot in some of our other streams and some of our other videos. Ooh, I don't want to make this too hard because I saw some people complain that these questions were too hard. I want it to be medium hard, you know, accessible enough where people aren't going to be pulling out their hair on this one. Hmm, okay. This is going to be a little bit tricky, but I think some people are going to get it. Scotty is definitely going to get this. Okay, so on a lot of these power supplies that we use, in particular the linear ones, these are the, your Voodoo Lab, uh, Decibel 11, uh, your uh, Walrus Audio. Some of them will use steel enclosures. Some of them will use aluminum enclosures. Now, some of them will use aluminum enclosures because it's it's a little bit better for the purposes of heat. So they can use the enclosure as a heat sink. And some of them will use steel. 
But I want you to tell me, there's two different types of shielding that these offer that are different from each other. Aluminum offers one type of shielding. Steel offers a different type of shielding. And I'll give you a hint. It begins with the word electroblank shielding. Electroblank shielding. On steel, it offers one of those types of shielding. On aluminum, it offers a different type of shielding. I want you to tell me what those two different types of shielding are. Aluminum offers electroblank shielding. Steel offers electroblank shielding. We want to know what those are. Email it to Mejia, and we'll figure out if you've been paying attention on a lot of these power supply talks. All right. I'm going to turn off the, uh, the amplifier here just so we don't get the, uh, the noise from that. Let's get back into these. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to figure out where I, la where I last left off, where we were talking about. We were talking about... Talk about the governor. We got to that. Talked about what a sleeper meant. All right. This is one from Devin. His suggestions. Boss CE2. I think that, that one's pretty well known. Bad Monkey. Okay. EP Booster. That one is super well known. Everybody's got an EP Booster. My grandmother has an EP Booster. But I agree with you on the Bad Monkey. That was a sleeper pedal. The Whirlwind Phaser 2. I think all the Whirlwind stuff is actually kind of a sleeper. It's really higher quality clones of the MXR stuff. So, yeah, I'm surprised that more people don't use those. Um, Scotty does not consider exotic boutique. Yeah, I don't think that they're boutique either. Uh, I think I think maybe they started that way, but I think now at this point, I mean, they're not they're not making anything in their garage by themselves or anything like that. Um, let's see. Did you talk about any DIY pedals? No, I mean I don't know any. If it's a DIY pedal, then I don't know how it's a sleeper. I mean, unless you're selling them, and then they're not really DIY anymore. Um, let's see. Bondi sick as is a sleeper. I don't know if I'd call that a sleeper either. I mean, people know what that is. It's it's not really like an under the radar, or like a cheap and expensive pedal. I don't know. I mean, I guess in some ways it could be. Um, ha, pro analog super quack. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, my buddy Mark Karen had shown me that one. It's a great one. Love pedals. King, uh, Church of Tone cot. It's a great one as well. Single knob one and the folded enclosures were great. Um, I have a bunch of, what's that? Shock rock? Sh I don't know if that's pronounced. I haven't heard of these ones. Uh, those are cool. Um, I'll have to check that out. Um, <laughs> there's a sleeper pedal I found called a Boss. <laughs> TU3, anybody heard of them? I'll tell you a sleeper tuner. You want, you want a sleeper tuner? I'll get you a sleeper tuner. Here it is. Here it is, Cole. Here's your sleeper tuner, the Boss TU12. You want analog tuner? Here you go. It's got a needle. Now, these are cool because they're the easiest to see that I have found to this day. Easiest to see in daylight. Has the least amount of glare. No digital screen. You just have your needle, you know. Easy, easy to see. Can't get much more simple than this. Easiest way to tune. You want to be fully analog. You want to start disabling the clocks in your kitchen and in your cars to be that analog. This is what you need to go for. Very cool. Yeah, that's a sleeper tuner for you. Um, Providence Chrono Delay. Yes, that is a sleeper delay. A lot of people slept on that Chrono Delay. It's excellent delay. Pink, but real men wear pink. Um, what's up, George? Uh, Noble's ODR, biggest, uh, I think it means sleeper. Well, I think it's pretty well found out now. I mean, everybody has a clone of the Noble's, and I think that the cost of a Noble's is like 300 and, I think I have one here. Where is it? It might be in the garage. I don't have that one. This is another one that a lot of people call sleepers, but I didn't include it because it's so expensive, is the, uh, Mostortion, the MT, uh, what is it, MT-10? MT-10? I mean, these are like four hundred dollars or something like that. Now, this used to be a sleeper. Now that everybody's found out about it, it's four hundred bucks. Um, let's see. 
Hey, Rig Doctor, I don't know much about sleeper pedals, but I got a question. I checked out the Goodwood Interfacer. I checked out the Goodwood Interfacer. Can I combine it with the Tapestry Audio Bloomery Active Volume Pedal based on buffers? I don't I don't fully get the question, but I, the I, can you use a volume pedal in between the buffers? Certainly you could. Uh, if the I don't know if the bloom the Bloomery has an active volume pedal. Well, it, it's it's going to help the volume pedal presumably by having that in there, so it helps eliminate any of the impedance issues that occur as a result of having a volume pedal in your signal path. Uh, it's not going to any pedal that's turned on is going to undo the input buffer from that point forward. So you probably are going to have a pedal on before you hit your volume pedal anyway. So having a buffer in there is not going to matter so much. Now, I don't know the quality of the buffer inside the Bloomery. I also don't know the quality of the buffer inside the Goodwood because there's no specifications. As far as I can see and as far as what they use on the stereo ones, I don't know what transformer they use, whether it can handle uh, or whether the buffer can even drive the transformer properly. There's a lot of question marks here, so I don't know. But if let's just say it was all perfect in a perfect world, I don't think that this would be problematic. But again, no standards on buffers uh, as far as stuff that I see commercially available or at least adhering to what we would consider to be a standard. Um, all right, Logan, I'm going to ask an easier one for the next one, I promise. Uh, it is not Dan Huff's actual guitar. It is just a replica of his guitar. I mean, not exactly a replica, but pretty close to a replica. Um, Jimmy Vaughn slip, switched from a Boss Tremolo to a Strymon Flint. Yeah, that was a mistake. If he had Robert Keeley's, I don't think he would have done it. <laughs> I use the uh, Caesar Diaz Texas uh, Tremodillo. That's a good one. Uh, it's the best tremolo I've ever played. Yeah, it's really great. Actually, if you like the tremodillo, you'll like the uh, the BFD. You'll like this guy if you like that one. This is a pretty cheap one. A lot of uh, Caesar's stuff now is expensive because of his re relationship with Stevie Ray Vaughan, and so a lot of people know about that. Um, love the Archer for Klon. Very good reason why I agree. Uh, Keeley one sounds a lot more full. Yeah, the Keeley one is more versatile for tremolo than the BFD for sure. Um, are you still a DM2 fan? I am. I have, uh, I have my DM2 here. Actually, there it is right here. DM2. Bam. With a 3005 chip in it. Got to have one of these all the time. But I don't know if that's really a sleeper. Everybody knows that's a... If you like an Aquapus, I mean, an Aquapus is, is a DM2 with a true bypass switch. I'm drinking mint water. <clears throat> all right. Let's go a few more. Do I feel that Oklahoma is kind of kicking the pedal industry? We have Walrus Audio, Old Blood Noise, and Keeley. Uh, I don't know if we have more or not, but I think they're great. Yeah, my understanding is that uh, Old Blood Noise was... The guy who is Old Blood Noise started Walrus Audio and then left. I'm not sure the circumstances or whether that was elective or something happened. Uh, certainly Robert Keeley has been around forever. Since I was a teenager, Robert Keeley's been around. Um, yeah, I think per capita you guys are doing pretty good. No doubt. Uh, a sleeper alternative to a Jan Ray and Timmy's of the world is a Love Pedal OD11. Um, I don't know, is it really that similar? I, I guess I've, I've tried the OD11, but... Uh, haven't had a chance to uh, to compare it side by side, but I, I do like the OD11. I think the Love Pedal's got a lot of cool stuff. Um, Greg, hey buddy, oh Matt, we let you down. This is a, a while ago you left this comment. I apologize. Uh, two notes reactive load box under a Strymon bridge would that create noise like a linear power supply would? Well, if it has a uh, transformer in it you you will have some potential for noise um because there's coils at least that are doing the reactive load and I, I don't remember whether that one has ac mains on it or not uh but you know you can test it it's an easy thing to test what i would do is i would literally take my my single coil guitar and have the volume on and just have your reactive load box out and 
see what happens if you can get it to emanate any hum by moving the guitar around. Another thing that I used to do is I just took like a pickup of an old Fender guitar and I literally soldered it onto a cable so that I could use the pickup to determine where the, uh, the, the uh, magnetic field was of a uh, linear power supply so I could dress cables around it so that it wouldn't create a problem. Um, so that's another way that you could do it. Mark Holly, what's up, buddy? We were just talking earlier. Stardust, that's a cool one. Sparkle Drive mentioned a few times. Barber, yeah, man, I forgot about Barber. He's got some really cool stuff. Um, fan of the Jan Ray, not really an underrated, but just curious what your take is. I think it's yeah, it's just a matter of taste if you like that that or not. I think it's I think it sounds good. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, I don't own one myself. I've had one. Uh, in the past, but I don't own one now. Um, and it wasn't that I didn't like it or that, you know, that I was like, you know, just like a get rid of this thing sort of thing. I just think, I don't remember if like somebody traded me something that I wanted more for it or what the circumstance was, but I think that they're fine. I mean, if somebody brought one to me and wanted it on their board, I wouldn't have anything bad to say about it. Uh, Ottawa, Canada in the house. <laughs> Solderless boo. <laughs> um, let's see. From... Instagram, Tech 21 DLA, pretty good, sweet pedal, analog pedal. I didn't know it was analog, but I remember the DLA, the delay was very good. Uh, my buddy Paul Trombetta is really into these. Paul Trombetta designs make some great fuzzes. Jack Ford, what pedal do you think could have saved Puddle of Mud's cover of About a Girl? <laughs> Did, <laughs> is this to save Puddle of Mud's cover? Uh... I don't know. Is it that bad? I, I never heard it, I guess. I don't know. If it was really that bad, I don't think any pedal could have could have revived it. Um, Carcosa is a sleeper I want. All right, well, let's... We've talked about some sleepers. Let's get into compressor sleepers. This one, the DOD Milk Box. Now, this one is one of the cooler ones. There's another one that came after this that's exactly the same, but they changed all of the... Uh, names on the the knobs to like dairy oriented uh, things like instead of it saying level it said cream and instead of saying compression it said like milk fat percentage or something like that and so it would like go from skim to whole fat or something like that and then they created like a design that looked like you know the pigment on a cow this is the cooler looking one. They're both exactly the same. Now the thing that people don't know about the DOD milk box is that DOD and I think they were all owned by Harman at one point. DBX, which is the company that made the compressor that everybody used in the 80s and 90s, all the Michael Jackson stuff, all that was all done on a DBX. Well this was designed by the DBX guys. So this has a DBX style compression circuit and it sounds incredible if you like that classic kind of 80s compression the Michael Jackson kind of Paul Jackson Jr. thing this is the compressor for that it does it better than anything and I actually recently shot it out against all kind of the DBX style clones that are out there this is still by far the best and the person that told me about this was actually Michael Thompson and the only reason why he stopped using it <laughs> is that he had a big gig, or I think it was for the Grammys, when Celine Dion had sung the theme song for Titanic. And they were had to do this fast stage change. And as soon as they churned over the stage and they were supposed to, you know, enter in with the, you know, the chorus section of the song, uh, the milk box, I guess, apparently took a dive and he had to go directly into the amp. And so he was afraid to use it anymore. And so that's the reason why he stopped. But a lot of those early records, Michael Thompson was using the milk box. Let's hear what that sounds like. I'm going to set everything to, to noon here. I actually uh, loaned my other one to Mejia. So he's got the other milk box sitting at his house. This thing is pretty pretty tight. I'm, I'm a huge fan of this. Let's get our uh, clean reference. I was looking for a guitar pick, but there it is. So clean reference. I got a lot of reverb. Let's take a little reverb off. Super. 
super dynamic in it's great for that kind of Jackson stuff it's like incredible it like nails that like just the the snap of it definitely does a great job for that sort of stuff all the funk stuff does a really excellent job for I think that this is the one of the best sounding compressors I'm actually building an 80s rig where I kind of wanted to get a DVX style compressor on this is the one I'm going to use because it just does so well at you know, holding in those notes it's really very musical sounds great i just got this one on reverb for i got it for like 80 bucks something like that everybody's sleeping on these this is like a dbx in a box sounds great Pretty low noise floor right now. The guitar is just sitting there. It's not out of control. Very, very good compressor. Highly recommend it. And if, you, if you're willing to get the ones with the, uh, the cow udders or whatever it is on there, it, it, won't, it, it looks the same colorway, but it looks a little sillier. But still the exact same pedal. 80 bucks for these like all day long or less. So definitely check out the Milk Box compressor. Again, if you're watching us on... YouTube, you're watching us on, or sorry, not YouTube, you're watching us on YouTube if you're already here. If you're watching us on Instagram, you're watching us on Facebook, come and join us over on YouTube. This will make a whole lot more sense, and it won't just sound like I'm playing in a, an electric guitar acoustically. You'll actually get to hear everything going through Pro Tools. Uh, sounds pretty decent, I think. Um, so let's continue, and we'll, uh, we're going to do another giveaway. I think we've done two or three so far. That means I have two more left. Correct me on that if I'm wrong. I'm giving away T-Drives. I'm giving away five of them during the stream. I think we've given away two or three. I can't remember the exact number. I'm asking questions. You're going to answer these questions by sending an email to Mejia at VertexEffects.com. That's M-E-J-I-A. And uh, Mejia is going to receive your answers to this Vertex Pop Quiz. If you answer correctly, you will get a free T-Drive. The first person that answers it correctly will be the winner. Uh, so, this one I'm going to make a little bit easier because we did have some complaints that I was making the questions a little bit too difficult. So, hmm, this one is a, this one is a fun one, but I'm going to ask this one, it's not too hard, I don't think, it's not too hard, but I, this is the thing that actually has been happening to a lot of people that have been following our DIY tutorials. Uh, when they're making their own gu guitar cables. So a lot of people I've noticed uh, on Instagram here on YouTube, they've been transitioning their solderless cables over to soldered cables. And that's great. But a lot of them are not following the directions of the videos exactly. They, they get the basic gist of it and they do all that perfectly. There's one thing that they forget to do. And I'm going to show you an example of it right here. I'm going to bring it up on the screen so you can see. Let me give you a nice picture because this is going to be good. While I'm doing this, make sure that you get your email ready with Mejia at VertexEffects.com typed into the sending address so that you can write this. I just want to see if there's a good illustrated version of what this looks like. I think I found it. I think I found it. All right. Let's bring this up on the screen. So I'm going to show you a picture here of a Mogami cable. You see it right there? There's a Mogami cable. Now you'll notice here that the center conductor here, separately from the shield, which is kind of that shiny coppery part, there's no black over that. However, when you buy a Mogami cable, like a 2524, 2319, or a 2314 new, and this goes for almost any cable that you make, there's going to be this black stuff over that. It's conductive plastic. I want to know 
why that needs to be removed. What happens if you don't remove that and you go to make your soldered cable? What happens if you try to make your own cables and you don't remove that solder or that black conductive plastic and you end up soldering that to your connector? Why don't you want to do that? Why is it important that you remove this conductive plastic? First person to email Mejia with the correct answer will win a free tea drive. All right. Let's see. Let's see, you've got a couple more good ones. Ryan Morgan, Carcosa's killer. You know it, buddy. Um, let's see. It's my sleeper divided by 13 lift. Yeah, I forgot that divided by 13 was making some pedals. Beat out an original claw, an original blues break. Well, I guess it depends on what you want, right? Because it's not that that's necessarily emulating any of those pedals, but Ross Chorus R88, I remember those, those are great. MXR M300 Reverb, if that's the MXR Reverb, I don't know if it's a sleeper, they, they probably sold 50,000 of those, they're everywhere. Prince of Tone, okay, yeah, I guess not, not, not as, you know, not quite as popular as the King of Tone, but still some in there. Digitech Expression Factory, yeah, that'd be a good one, that's a good one. We already talked a little bit about the Nobles ODR-1. Um, DOD Looking Glass and Menatone King of the Britons. I would agree with those. We talked about the Looking Glass a little bit earlier, but the Menatone King of the Britons is great. Also the Red Snapper, although I don't know how if the Red Snapper falls into sleeper category. Um, Dan Electro Tuna Melt. Yep, those are cool. The Benoit from Barkus Berry from BBE, also very excellent. Boss DD20, also excellent. Uh, we had some people say Timmy by way of Jan Ray uh, in uh, the Love Pedal um, Amp 11. Um, let's see. Spaceman FX Voyager. Yeah, Spaceman FX has been slept on for sure. I would agree with that. Let's see. Love my BBE two-timer delay from 15 years ago. I don't know that one. How about the Digitech Supernatural, Big Sleeper? Yeah, Digitech Supernatural I actually have the one that came before the Supernatural, which is this one, the uh, RV7. This is a, my favorite reverb uh, of any Stompbox style reverb. This is the, my favorite one. It has a lexicon chip in it. And the, the Supernatural was, was kind of just a, a, a side kind of shooter, a derivative of this one. Very, very excellent. Uh, digital reverb, one of the best ones out there, especially if you want kind of the classic studio sound effect. Let's let's plug this guy in right now. I'm I'm going to put on my favorite setting, which is the uh, the plate, the plate setting. It's very reminiscent to me of the classic kind of studio lexicon like PCM series stuff. I think it sounds great, very natural. I'm going to turn the reverb off on the amp. Let's hear this thing. Oh, you know what? <laughs> We're not going to be able to use this because I modded it to 100% wet. So all you're hearing is wet. <laughs> I forgot I did that. Yeah, so actually this will be a bad example. I'll have to re-demo this again when uh, I have it in uh, a parallel mixer because it is modified to be 100% wet just like you know you'd find a lexicon reverb in a mix bus so i cannot demo this for you in series in front of an amplifier where it will have any resemblance to what it should actually sound like i've modified this one so that it can be 100% wet all the time so but do check this guy out sometimes people know what this is and they do get expensive but if you put a search on uh, like reverb on, or on ebay and just have like a notification show up for any time the hardwire RV7 comes up, you can get one for probably 100, 110. Uh, so, highly recommend this guy. I'm trying to see if I have another. I don't have any other. Actually, I do have another reverb, so let's talk about that one. The other reverb, which I, it kind of falls in that semi sleeper range, is the, uh, the Boss FVR1. Yeah, FVR1. This is the best spring reverb I've ever found. I haven't found a spring reverb that is better than this one. It sounds great. It's very natural. I actually have a Fender spring reverb tank, and it is incredibly close to that. 
let's just uh, let's just compare because I have a spring reverb tank right now in the uh, concert. All right. got that that soupiness that you'd want in a in a surfy kind of reverb actually the guy that had turned me on to this is this rockabilly guy named deke dickerson he's like a huge fan of these uh when they can't take their reverb tanks for these rockabilly gigs but man it, it really has the the soupiness it doesn't sound digital to me at all it really has like a beautiful natural kind of lush <laughs> definitely has it has it in spades i think it's really great for any of the fender kind of classic reverb stuff that you here's a kind of a a little less mixed out. I think it's great. Be best Fender sounding reverb that I found out there for spring reverb style that's not actually a spring reverb tank. It's the best I've found. So, highly recommend you check out the Boss FRV1. These, again, some guys know about them, so they can get expensive, but if you put on a Craigslist notification or an eBay notification or a Reverb notification, you will ultimately be able to find one, I'd say, 100 bucks. I think I paid about 100 bucks for this one. In fact, Mejia went to somebody's house in San Francisco and got this one for me, and I just Venmoed him the money because I saw it come up for cheap. And... Uh, it's definitely one that you need to have in your repertoire. Let's take uh, some more questions here, and uh, we'll get going. Uh, let's see. Let me turn up the amp. Deadbeat Modulation Station. These are some good recommendations here. I haven't heard of this. Uh, Digitech Obscura Delay, I would agree with. The M300, I don't know, man. They sold a lot of those. <laughs> uh, opinion on the Friedman Power Grid. I haven't tested one myself, but my understanding is that they are a switch mode power supply, which is definitely the way I think you'd want to go these days. Uh, I have a TS-808 for playing at an apartment at low volume, but think it is for playing at a loud volume. Well, it certainly will sound better at a loud volume because the more gain you use from it, the smaller it's going to kind of make your signal sound uh, when you are at a, don't have much going on in your amp. Hungry Robot The Wash, very underrated. Yeah, I've, heard, I've, I've played that one before. Uh, one of my buddies, Mark Karen, had that one. Um, yeah, I hadn't heard of it before he showed it to me. Ibanez LA Metal, Biggest Sleeper, Rat Copy. Yeah, you know who told me about that? It was my buddy Peter Melton from uh, Quilter Amps. Um, Noble's already ODR1. Yeah, I don't know if they're Sleeper anymore, though. TC Nova Modulator. All the Nova stuff I thought was was really great. Uh, what's up, Jmar? Um... I don't know what this is talking about. Um... <laughs> Gabby Bergman, Digitech Bad Monkey, Massive Sleeper. Love the Milk Box, it's the one. Fearful Circuitry Accountant Compressor, I haven't heard of that one. CP9 Pro Plus is based on the DBX as well. However, I found in shooting them out with this just a couple of days ago, this was a better fit uh, or a better representation to me to the DBX thing. Um... <laughs> You wish you were never like, yeah, George was in the premiere uh, Michael Jackson cover band 
Um, and uh, I don't remember. Were you even using a compressor on that, George? I don't even remember seeing a compressor on that rig. Um, the BBE also does the Sonic, or the Milkbox also does the BBE Sonic Expander thing. I don't know. I think that the expansion is more of like a presence control. It's a little bit different, I think, than what the Marcus Berry thing does. Um, do I have a favorite tape echo pedal? I think the most accurate sounding is the Dunlop one. That is the most accurate sounding. Um, let's see. Can you tell us once the answer has been given? Well, Mejia will email back the first people who have answered correctly. 65 amps color boost. It's kind of like a, uh, a treble booster, if I believe, uh, or if I remember correctly. K any Kingsley pedal. Yeah, Kingsley. Well, I think they, now the uh, pedal show guys have kind of helped seed them a little bit better. But, yeah, they do make great stuff, and they were definitely slept on. MOSFET version of the full drive. Full drive is pretty popular. I don't know if I'd call it a sleeper. Um, Giga Delay was slept on. Yeah, I think it was. So is the DD500, though. That's another one I think is slept on, the newer version. Um, been hard to come back by a hardwire reverb blade. A couple listings I've seen. Yeah, but I think that, you know, I've been talking about them a lot, but I don't think that much. I think that I put, I, I got one recently for, I think, 100. So just stay patient. Mad Professor Roy Blue OD. I haven't played that one, but I love the Mad Professor stuff. True Tone Jekyll and Hyde V3. I haven't played that one. Maxon 80999 is a sleeper. Yeah, in fact, I think I have Mejia somewhere over here. Um, yeah, those are great. All the Maxon ones were great. I agree. Um, the winners will be emailed directly. Um, and if you are questioning the transparency, we can always send you screenshots of the order that they came in if that is necessary for you. Um, Paul Ewing, one of the best ODs I've ever heard was a Tech in Tones Turbo Nona. Is that like a, like a hyped up grandmother? The Turbo Nona. Um, the other one is the Lawrence Petros. I have over 100 pedals. I've sold many. I use 70 and live. Yeah, I, I think the Petros stuff is cool for the Marshall thing for sure. I haven't tried a lot of his other stuff though. Um, better than the Holy Grail big box? Oh yeah, well I mean it's different than the Holy Grail because the Holy Grail, oh I think you're talking about the, for, for uh, this is better than the Holy Grail, unquestionably. It is also a lot quieter than the Holy Grail, which has a lot of issues with noise. Um, so I would say that. Um, might not qualify as a sleeper, but uh, emulating specific reverb, the T-Rex Whirly Verb Reverb, huh? Let's see. Is the Seox DC7 a switch or linear supply? It's a switch mode supply. Homebrew pedals, yeah, I've had a couple of those. Uh, and the Hartman pedals, yeah, Hartman pedals are not in existence anymore, but I have a lot of Hartman pedals because Theo just lives down the street here. He lives really close to me. Um, but he's completely out of the game, doesn't service pedals, doesn't, doesn't do anything with pedals anymore. So that's a bummer because he had a lot of really good stuff. Um, Snarling Dog Super Ball Wino Wah. Yeah, they sounded good, but they looked awful. I couldn't get past the look, so it was hard for me to go for it. Any thoughts on the uh, Walrus Audio 385? Uh, I think that's the tape proje or the projector one. I, I, did, I, I don't have a good reference point. Um, for pedals that represent that. I've played some of the Austin Hooks projector amps, but uh, I've never played it with the pedal side by side to really know how close it got. Um, 8999, great one. Um, Boss FRV1 is amazing. I know it's, it's a good one. Uh, you want a mind blowing pedal for 20 bucks? Try the new Mosky Plexi M. I have reviewed 1,173 pedals, of which about 700 or 600 are dirt pedals. I know a little about ODs, cool. Uh, MI Audio Effects Crossover Drive. In fact, the MI Audio um, Crunch Box is based on the Marshall Governor. Uh, so many pedals are based on the Marshall Governor. A lot, a lot of these Marshall pedals that we hear about, they're all based on the Governor. We should, we should try this one next, in fact. Um, 19, early 90s Swedish boutique, Golmer the Blues, huh? Delay Llama Extreme. 
Um, that's uh, the jam pedals. Yeah, I think the people don't know about that one from jam pedals. They know about other jam pedals. Digitech Bad Monkey, you've heard that a lot. Um, DOD 410 Bifet Boost. Okay, I'm with you. Do you really like Boss Buffers? No, I don't like Boss Buffers. Um, but they have some great pedals. I think the idea of the Boss Buffer is a good idea. The execution of the Boss Buffer, not so good. All right, let's try this Governor. This is the Governor. Gary Moore thing. I wish I had a Les Paul here, but I don't. Let's get a little input, output. Let's fire this guy up. So, so muscly, man. Definitely got the the Marshall thing. I don't want to get it too loud because I don't want to clip our. Uh... clean amp it's on like three it's not like a concert fender concert on three and this thing sounds like beastly like gain no loss of bottom end <laughs> of these there's the um, there's the Korean made version which looks exactly like this except on the back it will say made in Korea this one says made in England I haven't found there to be that much of a difference sonically to tell you the truth even though there's some people that say that they're so different I haven't found there to be very much variety and there's some of them that I've measured and so I think that it could just be a tolerance thing if people are hearing differences uh, and you can get the Korean made ones. I saw a couple last night for like 160 maybe. And this thing just like blows everything else out of the water that's doing Marshall stuff. And then if you want higher gain than this, you can get a Shred Master, which is a kind of like the next gain stage up from this. But man, if you just have this and you hit it with a boost in front of it and you want more gain, I think it murders like every Marshall pedal out there, especially if you're going through clean amp. This is the one to get the Governor. Incredible, incredible pedal. Sounds great, uh, unreal. I, I don't think I don't think you can compete. It's it's really great. Um, so let's see. Parametric overdrive. That sounds cool. I haven't seen that one. Dan Electro Spring King has an actual spring tank. Yeah, the only difficulty with that is that if you're playing it live and you're next to the drummer, you're gonna have a problem. Because I found that a lot of those pedals have spring tanks inside of them. If you're in an environment that has a lot of vibration, you can't really use them because you get crashes uh, from the tank. So just be aware of that. Um, let's see. <laughs> Eyes with no face. Yeah, well, I think that uh, I kind of butchered it, but that's kind of the, the... It has that tone, though, for sure. Like You can dial up the presence and really get that cut of like the kind of that interlude section of eyes out of face 
anything exact tone solutions they make great stuff and a lot of people do sleep on them they have a good uh, overdrive uh, kind of in that vein of the governor uh, I don't know if it's based on a governor but it's the atomic overdrive is really good uh, but I still think this one is man it's just so good it sounds so natural through a clean amp um, will a linear power supply like the pedal power 2 cause interference with pedals uh, analog drives are mounted above it even if the casing is steel and there is a metal hinge bridge between it and the pedals well it depends the further away you get from the magnetic field the less intense it's going to be so the more distance you can put between the transformer and the linear supply and the pedals on top of it the more the more it's going to dissipate it's just like you know a sound wave you know we, the further away you get away from the source the quieter it's going to get as you get further away same thing with the magnetic field now pedal power 2 is steel so it's going to be able to have more electromagnetic shielding we talked about this question earlier about electromagnetic was one of the, the answers versus electrostatic which is what uh, aluminum offers in terms of shielding so there is some shielding that you get from that and then if your pedals are steel that's going to help you some with the shielding um, but even so even routing cables is sometimes in the magnetic field can cause issues and in, in that can get into to the the line and can create some strange sounds or oscillation or or noise and so you just need to be really be aware of it you know like a lot of people even on rack shells have to be careful about not putting pedal power twos because they put certain pedals on top of that or other devices that are racked above it it can cause an issue because that magnetic field it sort of spreads out almost looks like a butterfly like kind of like this if you were just, if you were able to visualize the field it looks like a butterfly wing and the thing that we were talking about last time on our last live stream is is let's pretend for example that your pedal power 2 i don't remember what the max load is that it can accept you know the max current that it can that it can put out but let's just say it's it's a total of one amp, thousand milliamps. The more that you have, the more that you have on that supply, the more that it's drawn against the total current maximum, the total available power in the in the unit, the more it's going to intensify the magnetic field. So if you're at 900 milliamps and you're at, and you have a one amp max across the entire supply. It's going to be much more of an exaggerated magnetic field than if you're only drawing 500 milliamps of the 1000 milliamp max. It's not going to be as intense. So you'll find that sometimes if you start moving and changing pedals around that draw more current, that what currently or in the original state wasn't getting as much noise, when you now are drawing more against the source, it's intensified the magnetic field and now you've introduced noise that wasn't there before maybe you inadvertently blame it on the pedals but really it's that you have your pedals in the magnetic field um, and it's causing a problem there there's some sort of sensitivity of the device to the electromagnetic field and then that's causing noise in the system so these are just things to be aware of fender strat through a fender concert amp excellent DOD Rebberneck. I haven't played this, but a lot of people tell me that they love it. So I, I believe it. Rory Gallagher is a sleeper. <laughs> China Grove Doobie Brothers. Yeah, that could actually, that would have been the right lick to play if I, if I had, uh, had thought of it. Um, Dan Electro Cool Cat Fuzz. I haven't tried that one. Let's see. Terry Cap is a sleeper. Hey, Rig Doctor, can I ask what your thoughts are on the buffers in the Line 6 HX stomp? Do you think an external buffer is still necessary? Yes, I do think an external buffer is necessary. I don't think the buffers are the same quality as a standalone buffer like a Mesa Boogie High Wire or something like that. Um, so on mine, my rig, that's I think you can kind of see it's over there. That one has buffers that I've put underneath uh, some of the pedals, and then uh, I have a, a buffer in the, in the interface box as well. Um, it's just the only reason why I moved one of them externally is because I couldn't fit an isolation transformer and I needed one on one of the outs. Um, and so I had to put that in a separate box with a different buffer. Have you heard of the uh, QTEC Loco box? I do, and they have an excellent uh, overdrive that's very akin to a tube screamer that is excellent. I love the Loco box. My buddy uh, uh, Tony Lowe introduced me to that. The Rev G3. All right. How about. Uh, Shoe Pedals Robert Fuzz. Never heard of this one. I'll have to check that out. Fender Concert Amp is three 12AX7s and two 6L6 Power Amp. 
Sounds fine. I have one of the Rivera era ones, just to give you a heads up on which one I have. Can you give some info on what what a T drive is, in your opinion, and what it's comparable to? I don't know what a what a T. Oh, what is a T drive and what is it comparable to? Got it. Okay, sorry, not reading that one so well. So T drive is comparable. I don't know if I'd say I know that anything that I'd say it's comparable to, but it is based on an amplifier called a train wreck and kind of emulated their font a little bit in our logo on the T drive. Basically, it's sort of like a hybrid between like a Plexi and a Vox AC30. It's very dynamic, very interactive with your volume control. You can roll it down, and it gets really clean and chimey. You bring it up, and it becomes this fire breathing monster. And you just have two controls you have volume and you have gain. That's it. Everything else you're going to manipulate on the guitar itself. It includes your volume control, that includes your tone control on your guitar. You get lots of different tones out of this. Um, let's see. The, uh, the Mythos Argo, very underrated. I think that's their kind of like uh, clean octave blend, the Cobb. Manitone King of the Britons, yes, we had somebody bring that up earlier. I think that is great. Catlin Bread. Uh, I haven't heard of that one. I'll check that one out. Tone Freak Effects Severe Distortion. Claims to be uh, EVH. Okay. Oh, Rolf, I got a treat for you. Bam. Dual overdrive. This is the one. I find this to be a little stiff, though. I, I didn't find it to be that musical. I know Tom, Tom Bukovac sounded sound great with it, but uh, I can never get it to really do, do the thing. Um, that was just me. Exact tone atomic. Yes, indeed. Riley, you mentioned something about a couple of streams ago that you had an external effects loop box to add to an amp. I think if you're talking about a, a um, an external effects loop, like a, to make a passive effects loop active, I'll, here I'll show you, let's screen share. Let's screen share and I'll bring up, bam. Um, I think it's called the Klein, here it is, Kleinulator. Oh, there it is. Here's one here on Reverb. Let's look. All right. Uh, actually, this is not the right one. There's a smaller one. Climb you later. Let's see. Nothing there. Let's see. Let's go to uh, images. This might be more. Okay, here's one. So this is it here. So basically, what it is is it's a solid state version of a dumbbellator. They gave us a nice teeny tiny picture. So it's a solid state version of a dumbbellator. So that's it right there. And essentially what you do is, is you connect your effects loop set and return to the in and out, I believe. And then the send and return goes to the pedals in the effects loop. And then you can control the send volume and the return volume um, level. And then there's some sort of recovery, uh, which might be another gain control or might have some sort of EQ to it. I'm not sure. Um, but this is a, a unit that I think is great if you have an effects loop that is passive, like a lot of the Dumble ones, or if you have an effects loop that doesn't have any of these controls, this could be a good way to do it. And I think that as far as effects loop um, related items is concerned, um, it's, it's definitely better in my opinion to go with a solid state effects loop as opposed to a buffered or, or solid state buffered effects loop instead of a tube buffered effects loop. And the reason why is that tube is going to have a lot more color, so it's not going to be very linear. It also has the potential to add a lot more noise than a solid state would. So I think all things being equal, a solid state effects loop is preferable. That is what that is. It's basically an external solid state active effects loop that you can add to your existing passive effects loop. Um, you should make a shirt that says, yes, you need a buffer. <laughs> I don't know how many people would buy that. Um, Hey Mason, any updates on the Vertex production model buffered I.O. box? I don't have any uh, update other than to say that it's coming this summer. However, I am working with um, Creation Audio Labs. That's not Creation. There's another Creation out there. Uh, this is Creation Audio Labs that makes primarily buffers and studio equipment and stuff like that. His name is Alex Welty. And Alex is working on uh, creating a DIY solution for people so that I can show you how to make your own buffers. 
In the event that you don't want to get the one that I will be making a production version of, many of you will want that one, which will be a little bit different than what Alex is doing because we're using Alex's circuit, but his circuit is also very excellent, and, and it's, it's not like it's going to sound really different. He's, his is just a different concept than mine. It's not, uh, his is all discrete. Um, and that's another way to do it. It's not better or worse. It's just another way to get there. Uh, and his are excellent and his are very small and are going to be built into the jacks. So it's literally like you're installing the jack and a couple of wires. So most of the work is done for you. And uh, so I'll, I'll be showing you two different ways. You'll have mine if you want to buy a pre-made one that is, you know, my, my particular design. And then there'll be like a kit that Alex Welty through Creation Audio Labs will sell through his site. And you can buy them pre-made and he'll, he'll have kind of a vertex package for you so you can get all the things that you need. And I'm, I'm looking into getting the metal made so that you can actually just have it already pre-drilled, have everything done. It'll have like, you know, DIY, you know, rig doctor kit, something like that, like, you know, silk screened on there. So I think it should be pretty cool. And I'll let you know about that. Super chat from SD Design. Thank you, sir. Um, how do I get one of the Ditronic CS5 and TC1210 on a tight budget? Whew. Well, TC1210 is a little easier. I, I would say, let's see, can I pull one of these off without bringing down my shelf? You can get one of these guys. You can get the TC Chorus Flanger Pitch Shifter. It's probably about as close as you're going to get to the 1210. Technically, you'd really need two of these to really do it, but one of them, I think, will get you pretty close. So that's what I'd say for the 1210. This is analog. It's kind of a pain because it's got this hard wire cord on it, but that's where you are. The other one that I think gets pretty close to the uh, to the Ditronics, this, you know, the Songbird, this one gets pretty close. If you got two of these, for sure, you could get really close to that sound because you can really get rid of the bass. I also think the other one is the, the Boss DC2, the Dimension C, on position four uh, is another way to get there pretty close. So I'd say I would check those guys out if you're really interested in getting that sound. Um, Jerry, I got an Empress stereo buffer and it made a huge difference. That's a sleeper. Yeah, people sleep on buffers all day long. Does the T-Drive sound anything like the Dr. Z Z-Rec? Um, well, his Z-Rec is based on a train wreck, so to the degree that those are similar, I would say yes, although I haven't compared it to a Z-Rec. Um, what are your thoughts on the Marshall Drive Match? I think all those era pedals are really good. And, and you know, even though the Blues Breaker gets all of the attention, the other one's really great. Um, let's see. Keely Mag Echo and my timeline. I don't know if the timeline's a sleeper, but the Mag Echo, perhaps. Is Vertex going to make a stereo pedal board interface? Well, I will have one available. I'll also have a version that I'll show you that you can make yourself if you don't want to get one from us and you want to try your hand at it. Uh, any plans to release a fuzz? Yes, Paul Trombetta, in fact, is working on it for me right now. Uh, and it will be Germanium. Um, mod Tone Plextortion. Okay. I dig that. Uh, which power outlet on a one spot would you recommend for using a, an ES5? I think uh, the ES5 draws around 300, so one of the 5 or 300 milliamp output ones. Pedals to get Clapton sound. Well, what era of Eric Clapton? If you want cream, you know, you're going to need something that's kind of more martially. Maybe the governor might kind of get you there at a lower gain setting. If you want kind of newer Clapton, uh, I would say this is a good one. The Demeter uh, Fat Control. It's basically like a mid-boost because that's really what he's doing. He's got that mid-boost thing. There's also people that actually take the, the mid-boost circuit out of a Clapton Strat or buy the circuit and they put it into a pedal and they sell that on eBay. So that's another way that you could kind of get that if you want kind of the newer 80s era and beyond Clapton kind of Strat sound. Um, Royce, we've talked about this a couple of times. I, it's hard to know because there's no specifications on it whatsoever. And, and so it just makes me wonder why they, why you would release a buffer and not do that. It's sort of like the analogy that I've used, and I'm sorry for those of you who have heard this analogy over and over again. If you're building a car and the intent is to build the car with the specific lens of safety and yet you don't publish your safety crash test ratings or the results of those tests, that's a problem. It's, it's, it would, why, why even have the lens to do that if you're not going to publish those results? So it's, it's unusual to me that, they're, that that's not the lens that they have if their intent is really to build 
a high quality buffer. Now maybe it meets all those criteria and there's another reason why they haven't published it. I don't know. Um, but uh, it, it, it just is, is unusual to me. And so the ones I can recommend with 100% certainty, and I know that they meet a minimum criteria for a buffer, because it's not, it's not like a, it's not like a, a guitar pedal, like a, like an overdrive, you know, where you're getting it based on sounds, and so the specifications can be all over the place as long as the sound is there. With the buffers, it's a pretty clear-cut black and white math thing. It's either in the range of what you would expect for your guitar pickups to be seen in terms of pickup loading at one meg, which is what every amplifier that you would presumably use unless you're using vintage Gibson amplifiers where the input impedance is like 500k. For the most part, you're looking at one meg input impedance. That's taking care of the guitar pickups, isolating the guitar from the pedal board. And the output impedance on the output buffer, you're going to want it to be really low. You're going to want it to be somewhere around 100 ohms or lower. And uh, if it's not meeting that criteria, that means you're going to be getting some coloration other than what the, the sound is of your guitar plugged into your amp. And uh, so we don't know that. And, and to me, that's 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 disconcerting. Now, again, maybe it's everything's great and I'm being alarmist uh, about this, but um, that, that's all I can say is I don't know. I don't know because there is no spec that is published about it. The one I do know that has a great spec that is a dual buffer input and output buffer is the Mesa Boogie Highwire. Boss Digital Space or Space D Digital Dimension. Yeah, uh, those are great too. Love them. Um, Korg DL800 Rack Unit. Yep, I dig it. Fairfield Circuitry Barbershop. I don't know that one, but I know the Fairfield Circuitry. You have recommended the Empress buffer, but its output impedance is 510 ohms. Should I go for it anyway? You know, I think there's some confusion there because the stereo, excuse me, the stereo buffer has a different input and output impedance. And I think I looked at that and, and quoted it for the mono. Um, 510 isn't the end of the world, but it's not fantastic. You know, the, it could be better. So, you know, I would still check out the Mesa Boogie Highwire if you want to go really budget. You could go the uh, Bonafide buffer from TC. And they're just like single input output buffers, and you just get two of them, one for the input, one for the output, and you'd be fine. And those are like 60 bucks. Um, let me take a swig of my mint water. All right. Um, howdy. Got to get the TC. Hey, Jack. Gabby Bergman. Um, let's see. I think we got. Uh, I think we got. Mejia, tell me how many more uh, T drives we have to give away. I think there's a couple more pedals here that I wanted to show before we we finish up, um, so we can get to those. We can get the very last people there. Their winning items. Got the Empress, Empress input output buffer. Very good. Chris Moore, the Creation Audio Labs Redeemer DIY buffer currently has a 20 meg input impedance. What effect does it have on the tone versus a 1 meg? Well, his Redeemer buffer does have that, but the version that he's going to be making for the purposes of our DIY kits will be 1 meg. Uh, 20 meg is not going to have, you're not going to notice much of a difference after about 5 meg. After that, it's going to not going to make much of a difference to you sonically. But it's unloading the guitar pickups, and it's just a different thing. This is typically more reserved for piezo and stuff like that. Is it would be that high um, for passive guitar pickups that you know, like a Strat or a Les Paul. I Alex has a particular way that he likes things, and that's totally fine. I just don't hear 20 megs as being neutral. That's certainly not what the the input impedances of most amplifiers. So I find that the sound that most people are actually akin to and you're looking at totally neutral and you're trying to represent the amplifier to your guitar pickups as much as possible, giving them 20 megs is too high and unloads the pickups and doesn't give you a natural sound. However, it can sound a lot brighter and more lively because it's unloading the pickups. Uh, I just don't think that that's, that's the way to do it if your goal is neutral. One meg is considered the, the standard on uh, neutral input impedance. But some people may love his buffers and that's totally cool. Um, pretty new question anyways on pedals, but is there any risk of damaging them if power is being disconnected and connected? Uh, no, there shouldn't be any issue there. Uh, Ethan, we just talked about that. Uh, there is a shrub in your water. Yeah, there's a uh, mint. Um, let's see. 
Yeah, Mejia, confirm for me that we, how many of these we got. One more. Okay, got it. I see you there. Um, yeah, so let's let's talk. Let's go to this one. This one is, in fact, as soon as I sent out an email to some of our patrons about this, some of them emailed me. Henry Kaiser email emailed me. This is the Stampede Providence SOV one. This is kind of the very first sort of organic dumbly kind of overdrive that's out there. In fact, this is the only pedal that I'm aware of that is an overdrive that has Howard Dumble's stamp of approval. Dumble himself has personally endorsed and recommended this device as sounding great and sounding great through his amplifiers. This is the Providence Overdrive SOV1. It has one button for the effect, so that's the overdrive circuit, and then it has a boost on it as well. This is really, really cool. Now, it does have a power cord that's hardwired to it, so you do have to contend with that. However, it sounds excellent, so let's hear what it sounds like. I gotta actually plug this guy in. Old school. Let's kind of set everything at noon and see where we are. Let's see where we are. All right, gain. first Dumble pedals that I was aware of that uh, that kind of did that and just getting the, the nod from Dumble himself, it's uh, I don't think this has been in production for 25 years, something like that but they're definitely still on reverb and sometimes you can find them for I think I got this one for 150 bucks but sometimes I've seen them go for a little bit more but gets us really sweet lots of sustain chirpiness to it great pedal all around you know it has that ac cord on it which is a little inconvenient but if you just want to try something new putting something into your uh, your fender amp i mean again we're we're totally we're totally clean here bring this guy in and it's really Sounds great. Makes single coil pickups feel like they're huge. You know, dig this about it, especially if you're you want the mid range, but you don't like tube screamers. Like this is this is totally that going to get you in that vibe. And even the you know, little eye of the SOV lights up when it when it turns on, which is pretty cool. So big time sleeper, the Providence SOV endorsed by Dumble himself. 
pretty cool. Um, let's see, is there any other ones I want to talk about before we... Oh, we didn't get a chance to check out the Blubber Wah. I mean, we talked about this thing, but the Blubber Wah, if you, do, if you weren't here earlier, this is basically a clone of a Vox V846, but it's made in Japan in the 70s, and it just weighs nothing. The casting is super lightweight compared to a normal Wah, half the weight of a normal Wah, but same size. And it's got that really short throw, like an old Wah does, and they don't even call it a Wah, as we showed here. Let's even get to focus here. It's called a crying baby machine. I just think it's such a cool name. Like just just on that fact alone, we should just be this should be revered, and that it's called a crying baby machine. Let's plug this guy in. I hope I have a battery in here. Jack, it's a uh, it's a great sounding unit, very funky, got all the vibe. It's got that nice short throw that you know is, is perfect if you want to do the the funk stuff or the Hendrixy stuff, and uh, sounds great. And they're they're super cheap. I think I got that one for you know, like a hundred bucks, maybe a little less. It's got all the old parts, the 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 right uh, kind of iCar style pot, all that stuff that you'd want. They sound great. They're super light. I love it. In a, on a vintage board, that's that's the that's the wall I'm going for for sure. Um, so I think that that's all the ones that I wanted to talk about today. Um, let's see. Yeah, we got the clipping resolve. I saw I saw the meter going red. <laughs> um, let's see. Answer a few more of these, and then we'll do our final giveaway. Empress Stereo Plus Buffer Specs. One input is variable, 10K to 1 meg ohm. The other is 1 meg ohm. The output is 47 ohm. The other is 600 ohm. Yeah, so the 600 ohm one, and I, I suspect that maybe they've changed. They made one different because they've optimized one to drive their transformer, and the other one does not drive a transformer and so that may uh, be the difference is maybe they found that it's more stable under uh, a certain condition or you know, some of them will I've seen on some of these devices they'll build uh, like a Zobel network uh, or a servo around the the transformer to kind of help it be a little bit more neutral when it's uh, at guitar levels but um, I can't say because I have never opened that one up but I do know that the boogie one is great um, Jenner GS124, yeah, I can do it, but man, that one's pretty good. I mean, I, I'm not saying that that one was, I don't think, was built with the uh, intent of a Dumble, but it certainly has that sound. Um, I think the GS124 is cool, but you know, there's a lot of pedals like my Ultraphonics pedals do the Dumble Overdrive thing too, and we actually had a Dumble Overdrive, several of them to do it, and they sound great. This is a different flavor. It still sounds great, though. I mean, it's it's even though it wasn't res resembling a Dumble in terms of their design idea, I think it really has that, that characteristic, that's for sure. Um, we need more videos of board builds. I'm working on several right now, you know, but with, uh, unfortunately with Mejia separately from me, it's, it's, it's a little, I have to kind of set up stuff to shoot a little bit better, but now we've kind of transitioned into working from home and, and, and kind of what this looks like for us for the, for the future. Uh, I definitely have I plan to have three different videos out for the month of May, so it should be pretty good. Tone drunk on Monday. <laughs> Everybody's getting tone drunk. Um, blubber for the win. Yeah, it's a great one, man. It's super good. Uh, you should do a series of episodes like Rate My Boards so that you can give people tips and opinions on pedal boards. I'd be happy to do that. Any plans of using smaller enclosures for your pedal line? Well, if you've looked at the Steel String MK2, that's about as small as they can reasonably be made. If you want something smaller than that, then I think you're giving in to, to an ideal, which, which is, you know, obviously we can't really redesign the foot. 
even if you wore a size 10 shoe, you're still not going to be too much smaller than this. Um, so the, the steel string MK2, I don't think I have one on my shelf to show you, but it's about a third smaller than our standard size. So we'll be transitioning some of our devices over to that size. Um, but these, in reality, I mean, like this is like kind of like a normal MXR size. Once you put jacks on the side of this, you're wider than this enclosure anyway. So some of this is psychological and people don't understand that once they put jacks on their phase 90, it's actually wider than this because this has jacks on the top. So just a consideration to think about uh, when you're trying to decide on what's going on your pedal board. Um, David, not really a germane or not really germane to this topic, but I play a bunch of pedals in what I'm calling a damp dirt damp setup. Uh, I've got all my dirt uh, pedals into a Boogie 525, uh, the effects loop of radial splitter, once and then continues. One side back to the amp and the other to a 212 cab. One side goes to the Lace Tremos Chorus and that side splits stereo and goes to a Mesa Boogie 2020 power amp. Do I need a buffer for the stereo split? Uh, yes, you would want one uh, for that. So yeah, you would definitely want one and hopefully an isolation transformer as well. Um, I love your enclosures. Please don't ever change them. <laughs> your box should be the industry standard. Well, they are made out of high quality steel and, uh, you know, shields everything in there. You want to have that electromagnetic shielding for sure if you can get it. Um, all right. Providence Santa Great. It's the one. All right. We are going to ask the last question. So this is our last giveaway. Again, you're going to be sending this to Mejia at VertexEffects.com. That's M. E J I A at vertexeffects.com. You're going to answer this question to our pop quiz, the very last question. If you answer this correctly, you will win a T drive. Doesn't matter if you're in the US, doesn't matter if you're in any international city that you can think of. We will ship it to you at your location, provided that you have a valid shipping address. You're going to email Mesa Mejia, so get your emails ready, have the inbox. Uh, section filled out, have the send to filled out to Mejia at vertexeffects.com. And then the first person to answer this question correctly will win the T drive. Very last question that I have for today. Let's talk about, hmm, I already talked about solderless cables last time, so I don't want to give somebody a repeat, an easy freebie. Let me think of a good last one. Hmm. Okay. I think I, got, I think I got a good one for you. Okay. Mm. I should probably prepare these questions in advance, but I've been doing them on the fly so far. But I think I'm going to have to start doing this just so I don't delay your time. All right, this is a good one. All right, I want to know, with regard to boosting, when you're using, let's say, boost like this, and you're using it with an overdrive, like the T-Drive. I want to know what's going to be the difference in sound if I boost here before the overdrive versus boosting after the overdrive. What's going to be the difference in how it sounds? If I boost before the overdrive, what's that going to do to the overdrive versus boosting after the overdrive? What is the difference going to be between the two places to put the boost in relationship to the overdrive? Email Mejia. Tell them your answer. First person to answer it correctly will win a free T drive. I will take the last questions before we sign off. And uh, we've done a good two hours, so I think everybody should be happy. We gave away five free pedals. The other thing I want to mention to you is that if you are not already listening to the podcast, we do have a podcast that we were doing. So I'll see if I can bring that up. No, that's not what I want. Is that one? Yeah. We have a podcast. And it's on iTunes. It's on Spotify. It's on all the places you get your iTunes. We also are doing, not hinged risers, which I have there. <laughs> we also have a Patreon account that we've set up where we have three different versions of membership. We have a $4.99 level, which gives you a private weekly uh, live stream that we're going to be doing on Fridays, typically, with all of our Patreons. It's going to be a private members only stream. We also are doing 
private Q&As. You also get special discounts and things like that on Vertex products and early access to new releases like our uh, upcoming pedal boards and buffer interfaces and things like that. We also have a second tier, which is the standard, which is $19.99 a month, and that gives you direct access with me through email to con converse, chat, give you product recommendations, help you troubleshoot your rig, and it, plus it has all the benefits of the standard $4.99 membership. And then there is a third tier membership, which is the deluxe membership, which is $49.99. And that has all the things that all the other memberships have, except you get to do a once a month Skype or Zoom call with me where we go over your rig. And that can be up to an hour long, which is great. It gives you all the time you need to talk about that thing. And if you can't afford any of these, if you're looking at these, you're like, man, I really want those benefits, but I don't have the money right now to do that. I'm in a weird financial circumstance with all this uncertainty. Just send us an email, info at vertexfx.com, and we will grant you a free account at the $4.99 level. No questions asked, no means testing required. You just ask, and we give it to you. We grant 100% of those accounts for free, so you can get all of that access at no charge. So please do check that out. Again, that's on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com, which is P-A-T, what else is how they spelling it? Patreon, not that one. I get to label these a little bit better for next time. Not that one. Here we go. Here it is. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And if you go to patreon.com and you type in The Rig Doctor, you can find us right there. So I highly recommend checking that out. I highly recommend checking out our podcast. We did some really cool interviews with some of the top rig builders in the world in Europe with Paul Lenders of Guitar Systems and Steen Scridestrup from Scridestrup R&D. We have a couple more coming uh, from some major rig builders that you guys are really going to dig. And we talked to them about their whole strategy and how they go about things. They have lots of great advice for DIYers. I think you guys are really going to dig easy tips for you to be able to implement into your own system. So lots of really, really cool stuff there. And I appreciate everybody who chimed in today, everybody who answered. I appreciate uh, everybody who has participated. Mason Mejia, Mejia at VertexFX.com, will be emailing the winners, the people that emailed first. Again, if you have any questions about transparency and you think you really won, I guess we could show you screenshots of showing when the emails actually came in so that you would know that you were not the first. But I'm hoping that you'll take our word for it and, and believe us when we say that we are granting these. I already shipped out all the uh, prize winners from last week, uh, so they should be getting those in the next couple of days for people who won our last uh, giveaways for the live stream. But I'm going to try to do this every week. Hopefully, uh, we'll get some other companies involved that want to give away some stuff. I'm going to talk to my good friends Blue at Blue Microphone, see if they want to give away some mics or some headphones. It'd be pretty cool. So thanks, guys. We will see you later. Uh, and a private live stream for our Patreons on Friday. So if you want to join us for that or you want a free account or you want to start an account, definitely go and check us out on Patreon and check out the podcast. See you later.